Today on A Couple of Pointers podcast, we're lucky enough to have Ashley Gerber, who's the BDR team lead at Zesty and the founder of Refer Her. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I've been wanting to talk to you for so long. I've got a lot of questions. Let's start with just BDR stuff in general. How long, yeah, have, you been the, how long have you been the team lead? So I've been at Zesty for the past year and a half managing the team. And have you found in that year and a half, the practices that BDRs have has significantly changed or is it still pretty much the same thing when you started? I think that the, from when I started, I think that there's been slight changes. Obviously people are not picking up the phones necessarily as much as they were during COVID or even right after COVID. I think that emails are getting a little bit harder to get through to people, break through the space. A lot of people are now, they know the tips, they know to work with personalization. So you need to be really creative. That's so interesting. So you've just said phones have gotten a bit tougher. People aren't picking up as much as they were during COVID. Emails gotten a bit tougher because everyone's doing it. What's the cut through? Like, what's the secret sauce then? Like, how do you compete? So I think, as I mentioned, like making sure you're having a very specific message to someone that you've researched doing personalization, making sure you're targeting the right people. You're not just spraying and praying. Yeah. And I think LinkedIn is also has always been something that anyone could fall back on. But I think now it's going to be even more important going into the new year. And I've found that the LinkedIn channel is becoming extremely difficult as well. Like during COVID, you could just connect with anyone and you'd have at least a 50% acceptance rate. And that's just now like maybe 30% or 25%. It's really becoming tougher too. I definitely agree. However, I think even when I was a BDR and that was like... Yeah. Also, before COVID, a bit of during COVID, I don't know, maybe people just didn't like me. I'd only have a 30% <laughs> acceptance rate back then. All right. I, what I take out of this is it's the quality that needs to now be front and center, regardless of if it's calls or emails or LinkedIn. Like the only way you can differentiate yourself from the spam is like phenomenal personalization, really clever exactly. and creative approaches. Have you seen any, have you guys tried anything that's pretty out there, pretty creative and did or didn't work? At this rate, I don't think there's anything that's super out there that we've tried we've tried video messaging we've tried like having more of a sense of humor i push my team to try and use their personalities when they're on linkedin and emailing i think that being human can add points for sure to your content yeah so we do like lots of gifts but it's tough out there on that personality how did you find video did video give you a major uptick or Again, was it just about the quality? Wow. Okay. I really had high hopes for video because I yeah. keep hearing things about Vidyard. Maybe we didn't put it out there as well as we could have, but I thought my team's videos looked great. Like I was excited by them, but again, yeah. bias because I managed them mm -hmm. and people were definitely like clicking on the video, but nothing was going beyond the initial like openings. Oh, wow. So one of the reasons... I don't like video is because of how it impacts your email deliverability for those first cold outreaches. But you're saying that they were clicking on it. So you were getting over the delivery issues and they were clicking on good quality video and then it's still not converting. So we were also sending them over LinkedIn. Okay. Excuse me. No, it's all right. You need a coffee. That's Yeah. This 8 a.m. Oh, wow. Yeah, I forgot about that. It's the time zone thing. We'll get into that. We'll get into that early mornings because I see quite a lot about some of your non work routine and that's always been inspirational for me too. So just on this video, so you're they're going over LinkedIn, you're getting the statistics because LinkedIn is the right approach for video. It's going to get delivered and it didn't work. So have you cut back a bit on your videos? Yeah, we actually decided to pull back from videos for now and wow. try and make sure that the main three channels that like everyone uses yeah. are really getting the attention and making sure they're strong. So we've been focusing a lot on improving our email sequences and like making sure LinkedIn best practices are being shared, working on phone calls, always constantly coaching on that. And once we continue to see like an uptick in there, then maybe we'll go back to video. Yeah, I genuinely love that, right? There's no secrets. There's no special hack. There's no like growth hack in it. It's the basics done exceptionally well. Yeah, it really is. And I, you're like the first person who's who said this to me. And I know it's true. And this approach we, had to, we take at Pointer as well. Everyone's great. Emails are fad. This is a fad. Whatever works for a week. But it's the basics. It's the does your average performer know what your top performer is doing? to get different results and can you uplift a whole team like all of those things and this is why i'm excited to talk to you like you're on the front line doing it what are some of the things you do to help that collaboration 
like across your team? Definitely. So one of the things that we've been I've been big on implementing is first of all, pipeline is important. It's super important. No matter how much, how many activities you're doing in a day, how many tasks you're completing, you're not going to get anywhere if you don't have a strong pipeline. So I've been really focusing on helping my team make sure they have strong pipelines, learn to forecast their pipelines a bit. That being said, we have weekly one-on-ones. And so in yeah. our one-on-ones, we go over like their top 10 accounts. I have every month they put like the 10 accounts they believe they'll be able to bring to demo. So we go through that, we brainstorm, we had a war room with the whole team where they presented like I think a few days ago actually for the month of January, yeah. the 10 accounts they're gonna be going after, how they're gonna go after them. We talk about strategy and then from there, we make sure to talk about what they're doing messaging wise, how they're reaching out, what are they saying on the phone? If they've had a touch point already, how are they gonna use that referral? How are they going to talk about the company and the industry that they're reaching out into on LinkedIn. What are they going to do on their email? How are they going to personalize it? And really just making sure that they understand how they should be approaching things or if they get stuck brainstorming as a team because I'm one person I like to think I have all the answers but I definitely am not messaging daily like they are and so yeah. it's good to hear what's working from other people on the team as well it's that's brilliant right that really is brilliant facilitating that kind of collaboration and it sounds to me like your team has a little bit of ex extreme accountability when you have to bring <laughs> it's one thing to say oh I've got a million prospects the world is my oyster I've got an infinite total addressable market but when you say show me 10 what are the 10. What are you doing for these 10? You can't hide within that. You rarely have to bring it. Definitely. And also, I think it's good. It's important because I can't work on with my entire team on all of their pipelines. It's not yeah. feasible. So this way they know that like whatever I talk to them and what we work on as a team on those 10 accounts, they can apply to the rest of the other like 300 accounts they have. Yeah. Now you talk about pipeline. Now for a BDR, that's typically just booked demos, right? Like just booked meetings. Is that the focus or are your BDRs following through and seeing that pipeline actually turn into revenue? No. So my team is, they are very much booking the meetings for the account executives, Yeah. but despite not having revenue targets or seeing it through, it is important to my team when they bring in new logos. Like it's huge and we celebrate it as a company. So yeah, they no, do that's, care about that. It's awesome. Listen, I'm all, my, my whole team's booked on attended meetings, right? To me, that's their job. I'm never going to hold them accountable for pieces of the puzzle that they aren't responsible for. Now, if we were, we spoke a bit earlier about so this being eight o'clock in the morning for you. Let's talk yes. a little bit about mental health within sales and particularly within BDR roles. It's tough out there. It's a tough gig. And I've always looked to Israel as the, I don't know, like the North Star of BDR mentalities because it's such a resilient culture. What are you seeing on the ground there? I would have to agree. I think that for BDR culture, Israel's the place to do it. Again, I guess I don't really have the knowledge of how it looks in the US. I've only ever worked in Israel, but I think that we're very, we understand you need to take time off. You need to take time off. No one questions it. The team, at least my team, they know like they need to have some sort of outlet. That's very important to me. So if times are getting tough, I ask them like, okay, like what can we do to help you both on the BDR front, but like outside of work, what are you doing? Are you going to your soccer games? Are you going to the gym? Are you meeting up with friends who have an outlet? Or are you just in this cycle of constantly thinking about work, canceling plans, getting more stressed, coming to work, being like almost burnt out? Yeah. And I love seeing that from leaders, right? Because like how you perform at work has a strong correlation with how you come to work, like what you bring. And so in your one-on-ones, is that like part of the topics or is it more just a general theme? I think it's a general theme. I think that definitely on some one-on-ones with my team, it comes up more, especially if I believe we have a really open line of communication. And so when they express to me that they're really stressed about something, that's when I start asking like, what are you doing outside of work as well to maintain some sort of balance in your life and yeah i guess are there other factors that you feel like the company maybe adds or takes away when it comes to that stress do they ever relieve the pressure in terms of quota or look at it that way or is there always just a focus on you have to 
fix this pressure, this stress, because the job's stressful, you have to find external outlets to release it. I think that there's definitely things in which the company does. I don't know if intentionally to relieve stress, but for example, happy hours or team nights out or just like bonding activities, just like fun things that you can do to step away from your desk and socialize with others that maybe aren't on your team definitely always are it's nice to not think about all the rejects and rejections you're getting constantly yeah. but i do think it's something that is done outside of work i think that if you don't have that and you're not taking care of that or you don't have a leader that's making sure that you are you have your outlet you are taking care of yourself it's going to be really difficult to perform no matter what the company does now, one of the other things that I think helps mental the mindsets at least is a lot of people thinking this isn't permanent. This is a path forward towards my future and I'm willing to eat sand <coughs> right now knowing that I'll be eating steak next year. Is there a big focus on that? professional development? I believe there is. It's being a BDR, it's really hard to be a BDR lifer. Like I admire people who can do this forever, but a lot of people see it as this is my year and a half, two years max of like grit work where I'm going to learn a ton and get a lot of experience quickly, but I'm also going to be working like a wild animal. And <laughs> then there's going to be that light at the end of the tunnel, which is some promotion to wherever they want to end up going. But yeah, I think that definitely makes it a bit easier. And then as well, like on that, how much of your focus as a leader is on skilling them up for the job they have now versus skilling them up for the job they want in a year's time? It's actually a really good question. So my focus is very much on skilling them up for the job they have now, because yeah. I believe that those skills can really help in the future. However, once they hit around their one year mark, mm -hmm. that's when we start having conversations about where they wanna be moving to in the company. And I start giving them goals. For example, I have two guys on my team that are gonna be promoted to AE. And I told them back at their a few months ago at a feedback review we had that I want them to start learning how to pitch and demo and start doing things, even though it's not like officially a goal of theirs, it's something I want them to start working on. I think also like the pipeline reviews that we do helps prepare them for forecasting. That's an important thing yeah. to be able to do as an account executive. So once I find out what they're interested in, I try and give them more tasks and responsibilities that will prepare them. Yeah. And when they say what they're interested in is not sales, that's a little bit of a red flag. Always get that. Oh, I'm thinking, I think I'm interested in marketing. No, I'm joking. But yeah, I see that a lot. Like when I see pictures of you on LinkedIn with your whole team and all those social events and all of the training. And I also, I've also noticed, and tell me if I've noticed incorrectly, I often see that you're interacting with other BDRs, other BDR leaders from other organizations. Is there like a community culture there within prospecting or within the roles? So, so there is now starting to be a community. When I first started, there wasn't a community at all. It was more <laughs> I had never managed before and I had a bit of imposter syndrome and I wanted to make sure that Zesty saw me as a manager. So I didn't want to just ask constantly questions to my manager. So I was asking around to other people. I like literally outbounded people and was like, hey, like I see that you've been a leader in this space for X years. Can we have a chat? I'm looking for a mentor and tons of people accepted and were helping me along the way. SDR Rally came up yeah. the past few months from Rightbound and they've really created a community. So that's also helped. Nice. We have a nice. Slack channel. And so now I wanted to segue into your new company. Talk yes. me through that. Sure. So I've been doing a lot of mentoring on the side, trying to help people get into high tech. I feel like as a BDR team lead, part of my role is hiring inevitably. So I've done hundreds of interviews over the past year and a half. So I can tell what makes a good candidate, what doesn't, what people are looking for. Also, like I've spoken in these communities of team leads, hearing from them, they like and don't like in interviews. So I was like, how can I give back? Like, I feel like I'm in a place where I'm doing well in my career. I know what I need to do for my team so I can take on the extra load of mentoring. And a lot of the people I'm mentoring, especially women, were having some trouble reaching out to people at companies that they don't know to ask for an internal referral. At least in Tel Aviv, the easiest way to get a land an interview is through an internal referral. So what you would do is 
you just reach out to someone at the company. We all have these incentives to refer a friend and yeah. we're happily like able to refer them for the position and they'll get the interview way easier if they're qualified. That is just so clever. I've just, <laughs> it's just clicked for me right now. I would always hear and I'd always recommend, hey, you speak to people in the company to get advice to see if they can put your name forward. But I've never thought about that internal referral benefit and how you can align yeah. with that. Wow, okay. All right. Just light bulb went off there. Sorry. Carry on. That's yeah. okay. I, so yeah, it's like, of course they're going to want to refer you because they can, if you get hired within three months, they'll get a bonus. But a lot of the women specifically were a bit like stressed out or anxious about reaching out to people they didn't know at companies. And like, that's, I, that's a massive challenge, not just in Israel. That's a challenge all over the world. Like men are more likely to overestimate their capabilities. They're more likely to ask for a promotion, ask for a raise, even if they're less deserving of it. Exactly. So I was like, what can I do to make this easier? And that's when I thought like, why don't I create an internal referral network for women in high tech? for now here in Israel hopefully if it's successful it'll expand yeah. but that way women already know like they can see the profiles of women who are willing to refer them for their companies and they can see the companies they might be interested in and feel more comfortable reaching out because the person's already please reach out to me and yeah. that way also the women get the credit for the referrals and I'd imagine as well there's there's a lot of that bro culture in sales so you really want to get an inside an inside view of the culture of that company and an honest review of the culture of that company. Exactly. And also I believe it can help create role models in the company. If you see someone in a role, you can ask them to mentor you and could lead to a very positive relationship once you get hired. I absolutely love it. I really do love it. And so how like how does that work as a business? I understand the concept and it's a I understand the need like a genuine need and understand the benefits now to both the company as well, because ultimately they land up with better talent to the, refer the referrer and the referee. Everyone benefits. How do you, how does the business benefit your business? So right now it's a free tool. I think that it's important to just get it out in the world. Yeah. I have thoughts of creating revenue streams by going and have a, for the company kind of a page and mm -hmm. kind of reach out to HRs at, various companies and promote it, have a job board where they can pay to be listed, maybe give some talks about why it's important to have diversity, how to hit diversity quotas if they have them, etc. But sure. right now I'm more just focused on having this out in the world so that it can help people. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I hope there is a way to monetize it because we would hate for something like this to not be around simply because you couldn't put in the effort into it. If somebody wanted to be a part of that, at the moment you mentioned it's only Israel. So if somebody's listening to this, loves the idea, wants to, should they just reach out to you on LinkedIn? So we actually have a website. It's referher.co mm -hmm. and you can just sign up to be a job, we call them job seekers or refers. So if you already have a job in high tech, you can sign up as a refer, it takes a minute, and then you can already start referring people. It's all through LinkedIn. So we have templates for refers on how to respond and also for people, job seekers on how to reach out so they can just copy and paste the templates and fill in the like names and whatever they need. And yeah, brilliant. Pretty easy. Yeah, it's such a great concept. I, it's really, it's great. Thank and you. it all just clicked for me today, like on this interview talking to you, like, oh, I didn't realize the benefits. And now I do. It's a really you onto something here. And Thank hope, you. I hope it comes to Australia. I hope it does. <laughs> I hope it's popular enough to grow because honestly, my goal for 2023 is to bring more women into tech, not only through mentoring efforts, but hopefully through refer her. Yeah. And yeah, it's crazy to see. I didn't realize until I started really researching, there's only like 26 or 27% of women in tech and the rest is like male dominated. It is, so. there's some shocking statistics and I'll tell you, and it's starting at that ground level. I'll post a job advert. I recently did. I had 134 job applicants within 24 wow. hours. So like I got flooded and I'm also <laughs> quite interested. I'll talk to you another time about your hiring process and your interview process and the things you're looking for. But out of the 134 applicants, I had less than 30% of those applicants being female. So it used to be even lower than that because part of my application process was that they needed to submit a video. And I realized oh, wow, interesting. Th that was a barrier. So you'll know the tools like all of those very, there's lots of those different tools. So it was a an asynchronous video interview. I asked five questions, they'd answer those five questions. I'd get to see them talk. I'd get to see them, how they communicate. And it was great. So it, it saved me a fortune of time, but I was missing out on talent because I, what I discovered, somebody educated me to the fact that females are less likely to apply because they 
I may be subconscious, self-conscious at that point and not feel qualified. And wow. so I, I took that part of the process out and it has increased the amount of female applicants I have. I still have it as part of the process, but now I've been able to at least say, like, I've looked at your resume and I really think you would make a fantastic candidate and I'd love for you to progress through this stage so that we can have an in-person interview. And there's no fall off at that point. Yeah, there's a desperate need to bring more female into the fold. Yeah. Because if they're starting off at this point at only 30% representation in applying for the roles, imagine how that dwindles down to the point where you're now having to choose leadership positions. Yeah. It will become a self-perpetuating problem if we don't fix it. Super chuffed to organizations like yours. And if there's anything we can do to support you or not myself, or if there's anyone else I can introduce you to in Australia, you just ask. We'll definitely support. Thank you so much, Ricky. Really means a lot. Yeah, um, it's a great idea and I'd love for anyone watching this to reach out to you and just talk about it. Definitely. Now, one, if you were to give any parting advice to any female or male, I guess, looking to get into high tech space in Israel or anywhere else in the world, give me like one or two quick advice tips for how they should go about applying for a job. So I tell everyone I mentor, don't apply to the job on the site. Always ask someone to refer you internally and don't just message them being like, hey, can you refer me for this position? You gotta have some like tact. You have to reach out to them with a good message, BDR yourself, even if you're not looking to go into customer facing and be like, hey, I noticed you're on this team. The I'm looking at this position at your company. It looks really interesting. Do you have a few minutes to speak tomorrow? I'd love to ask you a few questions. Most people will say yes. People love to talk about themselves. And then from there, once you speak to them and they understand you as a person, then ask them for the internal referral. And a lot of these internal referrals like within companies there's sometimes polls or like questions that you submit along with the cv mm -hmm. it's like how well do you know the person or whatever and that kind of helps get you vetted past that stage instead of being like they're a stranger they can be like oh i have yeah. a feel for this person interesting yeah and vouch for them more out of the 134 people that have recently applied for a role this week zero did that and I can promise you if anyone had, they would have been top of the pile, guaranteed. So yeah. top advice over there. Seriously, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. And her.co, yeah, connect with exactly. you on LinkedIn yes. and just follow your advice once your LinkedIn profile's back up. Yeah, oh my goodness. I'm so upset. If anyone knows how to get unlocked out of LinkedIn or have my posts be posted, let me know. I'm going to post about this tomorrow. I know a few people who have landed up in LinkedIn jail and managed to get out of it. So we're going to, we're going to fix this. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> I can't believe I'm in LinkedIn jail. Ah. Yeah. Uh. No, it's it's a real thing. It's a real thing, LinkedIn jail. Apparently, you have to go to Twitter to message LinkedIn to get some responses. But no, we'll figure this out. Yeah, I will happily create a Twitter profile just to message LinkedIn and then delete it. <laughs> I have to. Yeah, no automations on LinkedIn is not worth the risk. Anyway, listen, I'd love to also chat to you again sometime later this year. I want to hear how Refer is going. And uh, I've got a hell of a lot to learn still about BDR management. So we want to get that from you too. Definitely. Thank you so much again for having me. This is still so exciting. And it was really nice speaking to you and hearing from yeah. you. We'll chat again soon. Thanks for being on.